Hi everyone, welcome to the first video mini lecture uh, experiment of Lit 340. Uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and uh, I guess let's just get right down to it. Uh, so today uh, you're going, we're going to be talking about uh, Michel Foucault's The Perverse Implantation which is a chapter from his book, The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, which came out in 1976. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to explain to you a little bit about uh, Foucault's book and the points that he's making in this chapter. And then at the end, I'm going to give you the framework for what you're supposed to be doing on Facebook uh, for the weekly assignment, or the biweekly assignment, that is. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So Michel Foucault uh, was a French philosopher and historian. Uh, and what he's primarily interested in is examining power and the history of power and how power affects society. And that is something that he does in his book, The History of Sexuality, which is not from the Victorian period, but is about the, the 1700s and the 1800s and the different ways in which new ideas uh, of sexuality about that time, that arose during that time uh, functioned as a form of power over the general population. And I'll explain what that means. Uh, in the section that you read for today, he's focusing on what is uh, new and unique in the social discourse about sexuality in the 1700s and through the 1800s, so the period that we're studying. Okay? And something that he's interested in is the historical shift from an obsession before the 1700s with marital versus non-marital sexualities. So what he identifies is that when you look at religion and when you look at legal codes before the 1700s, what they're most obsessed with actually is marital sexuality. So in other words, what husbands and wives can and cannot do with each other um, uh, within their marriage, right? Obviously, there's a condemnation of sex that happens outside of marriage, but there's not really an interest in defining all the different types of non-marital sexualities that can exist. So in other words, same-sex sexuality and adultery and bestiality and masturbation are not really sharply delineated from each other, not really sharply separate from each other. They're just lumped into this one big broad category of just like sex outside of marriage, okay? And while th culturally those things aren't like great to do, really the culture is more obsessed with what happens between husbands and wives in marriage. What Foucault notes is that beginning in the 1700s and then really picking up into the 1800s, rather than being worried about marital versus non-marital sexualities, there becomes an obsession of natural versus unnatural sexualities. And that comes about, uh, it's no coincidence, with the rise of science and scientists and medical doctors starting to declare their authority over human sexuality, over religion, okay? So before the 1700s, religion is really kind of dictating uh, the cultural discourse around sexuality. Starting the 1700s and 1800s, it's science and medicine. And they start getting really obsessed with trying to define what is a natural form of sexuality and what kinds of sexuality are in that unnatural. And there becomes um, a lot less interest in uh, marital sexualities and what happens between husbands and wives. And there's much more cultural interest in trying to name all the different types of unnatural sexualities one can have. Okay? So all of these different kinds of perverse sexualities, okay, we can think of homosexuality, uh, nymphomania, uh, zoophilia, you know, all of these like kind of quasi-scientific words we have to describe uh, different kinds of sexuality. Fetishism, which is something we've been talking about earlier in the semester. Um, of course, there's 
condemned by science as being like unnatural, unnatural forms of sexuality. However, something else that Foucault says is that scientists did not really want to eliminate those forms of unnatural sexuality, even as they condemned them, because having those types of like medical diagnoses available gave them greater social control over people and also encouraged people to police their own behavior more by making sexuality part of someone's biology rather than part of just like um, a behavior that religion condemned, right? Because once you say like, oh, this person, this person is like a nymphomaniac and they need medical treatment from me, the medical doctor, right? That gives them much more social authority, okay? So throughout the late 19th century, the period that we're studying, there is a real scientific obsession among medical doctors and among scientists who call themselves sexologists, right? So scientists of sex. There's an obsession with transforming just the different practices people engage in into making that a diagnosis of the kind of person you are, right? So instead of it just being like, oh, you're a man and you have sex with men sometimes, and that's like not great, it's a sin, but it doesn't really dictate who you are as a person, now it becomes like, oh, if you want that kind of sex, that is like definitive of who you are as a person. That makes you a certain category of individual, right? It's not just an act, it's an identity, right? And by making sexual, sexuality into an, an identity, it becomes a form of exercising power over individuals, right? By saying like, oh, if you are a wima, woman and you have sex with other women, you are a lesbian that is core to your identity and now you need me for medical treatment, right? Okay. So even though science is going around and saying like, oh, we're just now just discovering these new sexual types, right? That we're making these new scientific discoveries into the psychology of sexuality, right? What Foucault is saying is that like, no, that's actually a form of domination over people, right? That's a form of exercising power over people, okay? So that's kind of the first part of the chapter that you read for today, okay? Then in the second part of the chapter, you probably noticed that there were numbered subsections that each describe a different way in which this 19th century obsession with eliminating dangerous and perverse sexualities actually functioned as a form of social control over the normal population, okay? So in part one, Foucault talks about how the obsession with policing the sexuality of children, which is considered to be dangerous, right? You had to make sure that children were like set up on the right path in terms of their sexuality if you didn't want to make them go wrong and perverse, right? How that became an excuse for medical doctors to really start regulating what happened in family life. And not just like medical doctors, it made people themselves obsessed with policing their own families, right? And making sure that within their own families, nothing like weird happened sexually, right? So it's a form of social control, okay? The second major shift he identifies is a shift from thinking of homosexuality as merely an act that one commits, but doesn't really have anything fundamentally to do with who you are or your identity, to becoming the, C, the single key defining aspect of someone's personal identity, right? So like, oh, you're a man, you like to have sex with other men, that makes you a new type of person, that makes you a homosexual, right? And once we figure that out, we can be like, oh, the way you walk, the way you talk, the clothes you wear, um, the shape that your body has even biologically, that's all dictated from the fact that you're this, you're this homosexual, right? You're this identity, okay? Third, he talks about what he calls the spirals of power and pleasure between the doctor, the scientist, the psychologist, the sexologist, the medical authority, we might say, and his perverted patient. So in other words, he says that 
the way in which medical authorities observed and described and uh, uh, diagnosed their patients, there's a form of pleasure in that, the pleasure of exercising power over someone. And in turn, the patient sort of feels like through those observations, like the, the need to, to reinforce those kinds of perversions, right? So it's kind of the same way that if the doctor tells you, oh, your stomach pains might cause cancer, and then all of a sudden you become more obsessed with your stomach pains, and that becomes more and more central, right, to like the way that you live, right? In the same way, once the doctor is like, oh, you must be a homosexual, you must be a nymphomaniac, that in turn becomes more and more key to your own self-image and your identity, okay? And then his final point is that obsession, this cultural obsession with the danger of sexuality, right? How sex can really lead you astray creates this so society-wide obsession with sexuality. It makes everything seem potentially sexual, right? In the way in which, like, you can imagine a doctor writing a medical manual about, like, oh, the horrors of homosexuality, and now let me go on for, like, 90 pages describing all the different ways in which this is horrible, right? Right? It's this new obsession with sexuality and perverse sexual identity creates this, like, obsession with everybody in the 19th century about like how dangerous sexuality can potentially be. So on Facebook, what I would like you to do is to pick one of those numbered sections, okay? And in your own words, describe how obsession with sexual danger actually made sexuality a more central part of life in the Victorian period. And then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go through the excerpt from the memoirs of John Addington Simmons that you read. Uh, so this is John Addington Simmons, not to be confused with Arthur Simmons, who we read earlier in the semester. So John Addington Simmons was an historian, an art historian, and a poet. Uh, and I want you to go through his memoirs about his sexuality and to find evidence that supports the claims made in the subsection that you're focusing on from Foucault. Okay. So that's basically all I have to say about that. Thank you for listening to this mini lecture. Uh, and uh, as always, contact me if you have any questions about what was just said. Okay, thanks very much. Bye.